that inspired them, inspired you rather? What was it about them that inspired you? Uh, well, dedication is probably what uh, inspired me about four elders, somebody who wake up at 5 a.m. Hands on the dot, uh, dedication to patients, of course, neglecting family to some degree, like many do uh, for a while, but then uh, uh, just the dedication to patients, attention to detail, changing the dressing oneself, you know, the old-fashioned uh, doctoring that tends, has tended to disappear to some degree in what we do every day. Dr. Heilman, how would you answer this question? Oh, well, I would, <clears throat> my first mentor was Bill Shukart. That was the chairman at the program where I trained, but he was more a vascular surgeon than a skull base surgeon. And, you know, trying to decide whether I wanted to do aneurysms or do skull base, uh, I just didn't like the fact that when aneurysms come in, your entire clinic is canceled, your next day surgery is canceled, and your life never could be quite scheduled. So I don't mind doing long cases as long as I know they're coming. So I was attracted to skull base and anatomy and, and then trained with uh, John Ro John uh, Roten in Memphis, sorry, John Robertson. And he was phenomenal because he kind of was a self-taught skull base surgeon. He taught himself all his own approaches rather than learn from anyone else. And so he was just great to talk through cases. But I'd have to say Al Roten after that. I mean, to me, the basis of our whole specialty is surgical anatomy and just getting to be a faculty of multiple courses and listening to Al talk, even though I never trained with him at all, just seeing his dissections, uh, you know, the anatomy, surgical anatomy is the foundation of our whole specialty. So to me, I would have to put him up there. Excellent. Dr. Snyderman? I'd say foremost was the chair of our department, Eugene Myers. And uh, he was actually did the first skull base case in Pittsburgh with Joe Maroon in 1976, uh, based on the work of uh, Smith and Ketchum. Um, and it wasn't that he went on to do skull base after that, but he had the vision that this was something worth pursuing. And too many people in positions of leadership are obstacles and not facilitators. And Gene Myers was a true facilitator. He recognized this was not something he would pursue, but he recognized the value in it, and he created an environment that fostered um, bringing on uh, people who became leaders in that area. You know, Victor Schramm and Ivo Janica um, on the ENT side, and, and Lalikam Shaker, of course, on the, on the neurosurgery side. And I also had, they were also great mentors um, uh, for different reasons. Uh, Victor Schramm and, and uh, Ivo Janica, extremely creative. And to me, it showed you know, how they were able to bring in ideas from other disciplines and do things that people hadn't thought about doing. Um, and Shaker, I, you know, when you hear him talk about the old days and how difficult it was, you know, he was working uh, sort of solo in a very uh, unfriendly environment, uh, even within the own, his own department. Uh, a lot of skepticism, a lot of resistance, and it takes real champions like that to, to you know, push a field forward. Um, uh, you, you need people who are rocking the boat and, and doing things that uh, raise eyebrows. Thank you. Can anyone else comment on their mentors? Or, and also, do you select your mentor? Or is it just kind of who's there and happens to inspire you? Or, or should one be more intentional about it? Dr. Hanna. Well, I think it's really up to you to allow um, individuals who are committed, innovative, experienced, to be your mentors. So mentorship is much broader than who trained you. Um, I mean, obviously, I, uh, I recognize my mentors where I did my residency and fellowship as um, really who created my own way of looking at clinical care and surgical expertise. But you can also be mentored by people you watch from afar. And I, I would like to single out uh, Dr. Jatin Shah, who's here in the audience, um, just for his innovative um, ideas about um, when this society was trying to put together outcomes and, and uh, share information. Uh, till today, the um, collaborative, international collaborative study on sinonasal cancers um, is probably the most comprehensive reference um, on that disease. And I watched Dr. Shaw sort of put together this consortium of people um, to share their information. And to date, there has no been no replication of that in any other disease. So um, 
I think there is room for all of us to be mentored by watching great leaders who may not have trained us directly, but uh, see how they get great things accomplished. So I'd like to recognize you for that, Professor Shaw. Yeah, that's a great point. I think the NASBS has been a, uh, a good uh, source for mentorship for many people. Yeah. Paul, I, I would look at it, at least for myself, as an evolution. So, you know, like EHAB, I trained at the Cleveland Clinic, and, and in the late 80s, long before we were calling ourselves skull-based teams, there was a very effective group of both otolaryngologists and, and neurosurgeons who, who, who did skull-based surgery, and they did it as a team long before the society existed. Um, like EHAB, having trained with, with Jayton, having been his partner for a couple of decades, he had a significant impact upon my approach and my thought process. Uh, Mark Bilski, who was my neurosurgeon for, for two decades in the time that I was at Memorial, probably had the single biggest effect on me of, of any of my surgical partners, you know, what, what will probably be my entire career. And then lastly, you know, I, I, Carl mentioned this, but, you know, and the concept he have had, which was Vic Schramm, you know, I spent days with Vic skiing the back bowls of, of Vail, and I know he got sick of talking about skull base surgery when he wanted to talk about other things. But, you know, again, be, having the ability to pick, pick his mind as a senior person and, and gain some of that knowledge base. And I, I think, you know, that's what, you know, I think we need to encourage not just young people, but everyone, that mentorship's always out there. You know, you know the, the day you stop learning is the day you should stop practicing. And there's just so many opportunities to, to expand your repertoire and, and, and improve what you do. Absolutely. Next slide, please. So for Dr. Link, where do you think cranial-based surgery is going as a field? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think uh, it's been said over and over again that there's absolutely been an evolution, um, particularly in the North American skull-based society, where there was this first sort of uh, uh, epoch where it was sort of about who could take out the biggest tumor, who could make the biggest hole, um, could we just get patients through these uh, enormous undertakings? And then there was absolutely a sea change, I think, where it uh, became about results. And it wasn't about a case, but about all the cases and all the patients and what's going to happen. And I think that's been reflected in what we see in, in publications in the literature and certainly what's presented here in the almost 500 abstracts. And, and I think where we're headed now is I think all the people in this room are going to be seen as leaders in these diseases. And I, I think we're going to enter a new phase where it's not going to be just about what we can do as surgeons, but about the entire care of the patient and what's the role of neoadjuvant therapy and postoperative therapy. And, and much as the evolution of glioblastoma care has gone, where now we're looking at the molecular signature of these tumors, I think we're going to start to do this with a lot of skull-based tumors, and that's going to change the game for our patients. Um, and again, I think we can be the leaders in all of that. And I don't know about the rest of the people on the panel or all of you in the audience, but a lot of times, even at a, at a big institution like I'm at, I think I feel some of these diseases are orphan diseases. You know, nobody really cares about the patient who's had, uh, you know, six resections for a chordoma and, and proton beam therapy twice and so on, and what do you do next? And, and I, I think we're going to become the leaders in that. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Duante, yeah. I think the society was born because of the realization of the significant knowledge gaps we as individuals had. And that brought together the original collaborative surgeons in, in head and neck and neurosurgery to, to manage these, these more difficult diseases. But we're, we're, I think we're going to have to enter that phase again and, and add to our teams. Now, now, now be, it's going beyond the surgery, like Michael said. So we have to partner in with our radiation oncologists, our medical oncologists. They're the people we need to draw into the society because uh, the discussions are not going to be just surgical anymore. It's going to be timing of intervention, what intervention goes first, which uh, targeted therapy are we going to use, how does surgery fit into that uh, management plan for the patient, which is ultimately what we're trying to do and why the society came about was to maximize patient outcome. And I think for us to do that, 
we may need to move beyond surgery or to see where surgery fits in the role. No longer just a surgical society. Yeah. Uh, for Dr. Hanna, what are the greatest challenges uh, then for skull-based surgery in the future? I think it's kind of relevant to the previous question. Um, there is no question that surgical techniques and surgical approaches have seen a lot of evolution. Um, we've improved the efficacy of surgery. We've improved the scope of surgery. Uh, we try to reduce the morbidity of surgery. But I think it's clear to me, and this is what I love about this meeting, is I get exposed to things that I don't see in my own society. Um, the Head and Neck Society or the American Academy of Otolaryngology. This is a very unique meeting where I get to hear about diseases that um, transcend the scope of my specialty. So this morning I was sitting in a Cordoma, uh, early this morning, Cordoma session. And it just struck me that really, um, while surgery is a cornerstone of reducing the burden of disease, it's clear to me that surgery is rarely curable uh, for this disease as an outsider. Um, and it seemed to me also that there is a huge biologic question that needs to be asked about chordoma. Um, now, we all know that there are many patients with chordoma that got surgery, got well, and never heard from it again. But there is a, a massive load of patients that have had three, four, five operations, several rounds of radiation therapy, and still are living with the burden of that disease. So I think we need to start thinking differently, um, and that is a challenge right now because we are in the very early stages of being biologically minded rather than structurally minded. So surgery, uh, and even radiation, is local therapy. Um, you can only remove what you operate on, and you can only radiate what is in the target volume. But we really need to start thinking biologically, particularly for those diseases that seem to have plateaued in the results. I mean, this is as good as surgery will get, uh, or pretty close, to pretty common diseases like chordoma and meningioma and some variants of craniopharyngioma. And here I am, an otolaryngologist, talking about neurosurgical tumors. But to, to me, it seems like we're starting to see the beginning of a biological approach um, for example, I saw an example today, yes, this morning about a BRAF uh, inhibitor for a recurrent craniopharyngioma. These are the kinds of things that I think are going to be the future of what we do. Absolutely. Dr. Witterick, what are your thoughts on the greatest challenges for skull base in the, in the near future? I'm just trying not to fall off. <laughs> Carl says he, he can fix my subdural. That's my greatest challenge right now. Um, I, I can't add anything more to EHAB. I think really uh, the greatest challenge is going to be to come up with new molecular ter targeted therapies because we're only able to go so far with surgical resection and the biology of the disease. I mean, we're understanding more and more about biology of disease every day, but I think it's going to be the adjuvant therapies that are going to be the breakthrough for so many uh, skull-based diseases. That's where I would look at as the, as the future. Clear message, yes. Dr. Uh, Moore. I, I would say it's going to be training of, of skull base surgeons. Um, you know, so much of what we do is driven by technology. Um, getting back to the previous question, what's the next big technological advance? Well, I think it's already here. That's robotics. And working in virtual uh, reality environments, uh, you know, seeing things that we can't see with the naked eye. So we're going to continue to evolve in that area. Robotics isn't there for skull base yet, but I'm confident it will be someday. And so how can we bring the novice surgeon up to the level of the expert? You know, how can we bring the proficient surgeon up to the level of the expert? So it's all about technologies that enable us to practice at a higher level uh, than, than we were. Um, you know, how can we create a level playing field so that it doesn't matter where a patient goes, uh, that they can get the same level of skull-based care that they would anywhere in the world. Um, and that's, you know, part of that's going to be through surgical simulation, but it's, it's also a paradigm shift in how we train. Um, you know, we use outmoded uh, models of education. Um, 
what is it about visual perception that's important? Uh, how can we um, redesign our learning environment to capitalize on the, the latest in, in surgical or educational innovation? Yeah. Dr. Marcos. Uh, and, and even a step before what Carl, which is very important, is uh, it might seem counterintuitive to talk about it like this when we have record attendees year after year attracting um, smart and more people into the field. Interestingly, I honestly would not have predicted that given the generational changes that we've seen. This is a tough field and people have tended to choose perhaps easier career path. And I'm, I'm delighted, like I'm sure everybody at this table, to see that we still attract the smartest, hardest working people into the field in, in, in record numbers because our field would be in total disarray if uh, were it not for the young, intelligent, dedicated uh, people who get into it. You know, it's easy to choose. It would be very easy to choose easy paths that don't require the hours of work and training that we all do, but... It's very exciting to see, absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Heilman again. Uh, speaking of training, sort of a segue, I think uh, Carl's looking in the future again, but how should skull-based fellows be trained? Should it be, should we focus on open? Should someone focus on endoscopic? What about endovascular as a you know, role for surgical training for skull-based surgery? I, I don't really have one answer for this. The residents ask me this all the time. Should I do an endoscopic skull-based fellowship? Should I do an open skull-based fellowship? And very often they're somewhat different. Uh, should I do open aneurysms and uh, catheter-based surgery? I mean, the way I look at vascular surgery, I just kind of see it migrating towards the skull-based tumor surgeon will do the aneurysm clipping. I could be wrong about that, but it just seems like it's very much the same surgery. Uh, and the catheter guys are so involved with stroke and aneurysms and gluing things that down the road, they'll probably be more catheter-based specialty. So if I, if I wanted to do uh, microdissection, microdissection in the skull base, I love anatomy, I would do a skull base over a vascular fellowship, let's say. Uh, the ideal skull base fellowship should be both endoscopic and open. I mean, to me, they're very complementary. There's not one or the other. And there are tumors, you know, just take meningiomas, for example. There are some you know, that are way better treated open in my mind, some that can be treated uh, endoscopic, but there's chordomas, all these extradural things, all these clivus things, cholesterol granulomas, endoscopic is the way to go for sure. So I think the best fellowship is somehow incorporating both of those and Doctor, one over the other. Dr. Hanna? This is a difficult question because um, there is no definition of skull-based surgery. Um, there is no board. There is no residency. And the fellowship, skull-based fellowships, could be in a neurosurgical department. It could be in an otolaryngology department. It could be in a rhinology fellowship. We have not really put sort of a perimeter about the specialty or the different channels that go into that big box called skull-based surgery. And if you really think about the level of expertise needed in skull-based surgery. You need knowledge of open microsurgical techniques. You need advanced endonasal rhinologic techniques. You need head and neck cancer training sometimes. You need microvascular reconstruction sometimes. You need open or endovascular reconstruction sometimes. You need craniofacial surgery sometimes. You need orthognathic and maxillary surgery sometimes. And it, this is orbital surgery oculoplastic surgery, all of this goes into skull-based surgery. So I think training um, is not training of a skull-based surgery, surgeon, but it's training of teams. Um, and, I, and I believe the successful institution of a well-functioning skull-based surgery program will have to acquire those expertise from different individuals. I don't think today you can train to be a comprehensive skull-based surgeon. Um, just because of the nature of the proliferation of knowledge, the amount of skill required, uh, at a very basic level, obviously, uh, the anatomy and the surgical techniques with the open and endoscopic are highly complementary, but there are very few programs today, and let's face the reality, that actually deliver that for one trainee, where you get 
advanced endoscopic and advanced open in one institution in one year. Um, so I think the alternative right now is to build teams that bring the different skills uh, into your practice. Dr. Dr. Krauss or Dr. DeMonte, should we blur the lines between ENT and neurosurgical training for skull-based surgery? I, I think to a degree we already do that. I mean, you know, it, it's we, we encourage our trainees to scrub in on a part of the case that may, may not be primarily our case. Uh, we try to attend each other's tumor boards. Uh, we, I hope, lead by example in terms of showing our trainees the, the interaction that goes on, you know, both pre- and post-operatively. So I think to a large degree we, we've, we've already done that. Yeah, yeah, I think realistically we, we each have a particular skill set that is ours and um, that we have developed through our residencies and fellowships. And getting to what EHAB says, I think the successful skull-based program leverages the skill set of multiple members um, in order to optimize outcomes. I, I think, you know, uh, having somebody like EHAB um, who has advanced endoscopic skills has brought us up, you know, I'm bringing Sean on and has, has elevated us more because with his advanced endoscopic skills. You know, not, it can't, one person just can't do it all. Uh, so I agree with the team concept and training teams. You know, we don't do it real well because, um, you know, we're not, a, we're accepting one fellow a year in neurosurgery or one fellow a year in head and neck otolaryngology and giving them some exposure, but, but, I need to do it better, you know, whether or not we do that within the same institution or whether or not we look at combining programs, you know, combining, you know, so let's, okay, you go to, to, with Paul to, go, to Pittsburgh for six months, come over to Anderson for six months, you know, and, and maybe that way uh, create a, a more comprehensive skill-based surgeon. Excellent. The, the other issue is really not just about the skill set, but about the clinical conditions. Removing an acoustic neuroma or patient, treating a patient with acoustic neuroma is very different than treating a patient with sinus cancer, very different than clipping in basilar aneurysm, if we do that anymore, um, or trying to deal with a massive defect in the skull base requiring microvascular reconstruction. These are very different clinical scenarios. And I, I think that it's really oversimplifying to say that we need comprehensive training in, in these things. So I, I, I see no really other way than saying there are different skill sets needed and there are different paths of training to get these people in place. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, also we should learn from history is that this tendency to label ourselves and be proceduralist as opposed to disease-specific physicians. I mean, you know, the cardiothoracic surgeons were kings and queens in the 1980s. Look what happened to that field. They stuck to being procedure specific while their peripheral vascular colleagues embraced, for example, endovascular and flourished. And cardiothoracic surgeons are much weaker than when they were. So now, in, at least in neurosurgery, we, we listened to that lesson and obviously embraced the change. So again, you know, people go out and label themselves by the procedures they do, and that's a big mistake. You're either a meningioma specialist, you're not a cranio-orbitozygomatic specialist, and patients want to hear that. They don't want to come to somebody because, well, I mean, they do come because they do a certain procedure, but knowing that, and so we should train our fellows to be whatever, a meningioma specialist, and, 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 and avoid those procedure linked uh, labels, I think. Great point. Dr. Cr I'm sorry. I, yeah, I think there's, well, first of all, it's great to be a dinosaur. Um, don't get rid of your dinosaurs too quickly. You know, they, um, being able to draw upon old techniques is, is, creates additional options for you, makes you more creative in your skull-based practice. So there, there is tremendous value in having trained in an era where you could do everything. And, and I, I'm sort of, I'm sorry to see that disappear. I see a little too much fragmentation in many departments where you have silos of, of skull-based care that don't really work together. They may be part of an institutional team, but they don't work together in the way that they should. 
and there's too much internal competition, I think that's bad for patients. Um, sort of the, the flaw in that, in that uh, question was focusing on fellows. And really, we should be you know, using a Disney approach to, to resident and fellow training and saying, OK, what do the residents want? And redesign our, our four or five, six, seven year curriculum to give them what they want. And so that means getting through core training early on and then quickly choosing a path. And so our residents would be learning comprehensive skull base uh, across all the different disciplines as part of their regular training. Excellent. Yeah, Dr. Link. I, I think the point that Carl brings up is a really interesting one. And I know there's been a lot of discussion, at least in neurosurgery, that the training is just too damn long. You know, to, to make somebody go through seven years of residency and then do another fellowship uh, um, is just too long. And so I know there's been discussion, well, maybe we'll have three years of a core training where you learn how to turn a craniotomy flap, how to do a laminectomy, how to take out a subdural, and then your next three or four years will be subspecialization. But of course, the problem with that model is then you have to have jobs for all those people at the end. You have to have a place for them to go where they can actually practice that subspecialization. I don't know if we figured out that, that uh, problem yet. Absolutely. Dr. Krauss, what, is, what would you say is the greatest single advance uh, you've seen during your career? Paul, I didn't know I did anything to anger you. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think of, um, I think it's Watson's rule, the, 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 the computer scientist, where, you know, every 18 months our computer capacity doubles. And I, I recently read somewhere where that actually may, may not be true anymore, that it's actually increasing by a greater rate than that. So I think, you know, again, you know, I, I look around this table and, and, and I'm, I'm not quite sure that, Carl, we're the old dinosaurs. Those were the guys who were up here yesterday for this <laughs> session. Um, but, you know, this is, this is really my peer group. I mean, you know, the, 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 these are the hoods and the brothers I grew up with. And, um, you know, I think, so I think a lot of that ends up being, you know, what era you think about when you were in medicine. And obviously, I don't just do skull base surgery. I do head and neck surgery. So if you look early in my career, it was concept of spirit of cooperation and skull base surgery was the ability to do free flaps. That, that was a game changer. And then mid-career as a head and neck oncologist, boy, PET scanning changed everything because the patients that we used to just really worry about how we were going to follow them, we, could, we now have this incredible tool. And then today as I sit here, it's, it's just really scratching the surface, but it's, it's molecular biology. So, you know, several people have already alluded to that in, in their answers today, but we really are on the dawn of personalized medicine, of turning cancer into a, a chronic disease akin to the way that people don't really die of AIDS anymore. And so, you know, it, it, I think it depends on what part of your career you look at. If I do it right now and what's newest, and that's obviously kind of the, you know, it, it, it introduces the bias. But if, if I do right now, it's, it's just this whole era of molecular oncology changing everything. Okay. Dr. Witterick, what areas of cranial surgery most need improvements or the other side of the coin? Yeah, I, I, again, we've already uh, other, started... other than neurosurgery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, um, the whole training aspect, uh, we need some improvement on that and clarification of fellowships and how you build a team, I think, uh, because we're all struggling with that right now. Uh, there's some initiatives about that. Um, and I was going back, I was just thinking, one of the other advances that I, I was just thinking of was the, the endoscope. So switching from that sort of everything open, how big of a hole can we make to, to doing that? And there's still advances um, uh, for that, particularly with potential for robotics. So. What I would love to see is more miniaturization um, of the equipment that we have to do the endoscopy, the ability to have arms inside the nose and sinuses to, to manipulate that. And then uh, the other thing is I think we need better cooperation with uh, some of our other allied health professionals, radiation, medical oncology, because uh, in many institutions it still sort of seems that even at this meeting they're, they're kind of sometimes an afterthought. And I think uh, we have to bring them into the, the forefront for our future. And uh, the molecular uh, oncology, I think, is going to be critical for treatment of skull-based disease. Well, long way to go. Any, any other thoughts on which areas we need to work on most? 
Yeah, I think <clears throat> I'm going to sh shift from what needs to happen technically and in, in, in terms of instrumentation or techniques to a more um, infrastructure um, area. So these are rare diseases. A lot of them are orphan diseases. They're heterogeneous. Um, even within the same disease, you have various grades and biologies. Example would be chondrosarcomas, low-grade chondrosarcomas and high-grade chondrosarcomas are very different diseases. So I think what we really need to gain more knowledge here is an informatics infrastructure that we need to lead that would gather all these data points about these rare diseases in a systematic fashion to group them in the right bucket. Um, going back to the chondrosarcoma example of how they are very disparate depending on grade. We need, nobody else will know that other than the expert. We need to drive the informatic system that is risk adjusted for what is meaningful so that we finally have a data system that informs our actions and gaps of knowledge so we can improve what we're doing. Until we get that done, until we have data systems that actually builds our knowledge um, to that level of detail, I think it will, we will continue to improve as we have. But I think having that infrastructure would accelerate our improvement uh, in ways that nothing else would. No instrument, no better microscope, no better endoscope, no better sealant will make the quantum improvement that an informatics structure that is designed well um, will do to this field. So that's what I think we should really focus on our efforts in the future. Okay. Current Don of the Pittsburgh Mafia, uh, Dr. Schneiderman, you see there embracing his uh, Disney culture. Um, how do you think we can continue to grow as a field? You know, it's uh, seeing how the skull-based society has, you know, literally exploded in the last several years. How can we continue this and, and build on it? I mean, that's a tough question. I mean, certainly part of it will be driven by technology and we will, you know, learn new techniques, uh, you know, bring new things into the field. But I, I think in order for this to be a healthy society, we need to continue to grow its diversity. Um, you know, s societies die because they get too small and they lack input from other disciplines. Uh, you know, you can't have a society of, or, or innovation cannot occur with one, one individual. Um, so continuing to look beyond our borders to bring in people from other disciplines, uh, uh, different backgrounds, uh, so that we are, we're constantly um, flooded with, with fresh ideas and to really, you know, look outside our specialty to see what are others doing, what are other specialties doing. I mean, to me, that's the, the, the greatest value of skull-based surgery is working with another discipline and being able to see how others think and, and do things differently and then bring those back to your own practice. Dr. Link, what are your thoughts on how we can continue to grow the field? <clears throat> well, I'd, I'd agree very much with uh, what Carl just said. And um, I think we do have a great opportunity to bring in other disciplines. Um, we talk about it at the board meeting that if we can get um, you know, our ophthalmologic colleagues, our medical and radiation colleagues more engaged and willing to come to this meeting um, and share their expertise uh, with us. I think that's going to go a long way. Dr. Devante, what's the most in, uh, important advance during your career uh, for cranial-based surgery? I hate to say it, but the MRI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that, started, that was back in the 80s. Um, It's, it's like Dennis said, each, you know, time frame in your career carries something that, that has made a big difference. In the first part, you know, the ability to actually see things preoperatively with MRI imaging, you know, weren't just dependent on CT. And as time went on, the, the sequential development of the different open approaches, the um, introduction uh, of the new technologies as they came available, the, the endoscopic cameras, and more importantly, the uh, refined endoscopic instrumentation, that's going to continue 
uh, to change. And then uh, I think, as Dennis said, the game changer uh, is going to be our, our, our mindset change to not only being technically and, and um, uh, surgically driven end, uh, endpoints, but to disease endpoints. To, and, and that's going to um, bring in the molecular biology world, the, the pathologists, the radiation oncologists, the medical oncologists. And we need to be the drivers. So, so in our own institutions, you know, when you go down to frozen section, you start having discussions with your pathologist, <coughs> you need to maybe try to get them to change their ideas about what their career paths could be. You know, it, it, so okay, you have a couple head and neck pathologists. It just takes one to say, hey, you know, I could make a career of skull-based pathology. One medical oncologist say, hey, I could own these rare diseases and make a career of skull-based um, uh, uh, medical oncology. And, and that's how I think you, you really uh, bring the people into your field. I think that's what's happened in our institution. We've identified people who have shown an interest and then who finally make the switch in their heads, I can do this as, as my career path. And uh, that's how we, I think we get them into our society. And that's going to change how we do That's a, a great message. Dr. Morcos, what would you say is the most important advance you've seen? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, if depending how you define it, I mean, there is no question that the slope with the highest, I mean, the, high, the, the curve with the highest slope in my career has been the endovascular changes. I remember my first year residency, 1990. There was a neurosurgeon, none of you here would, would know. Uh, I remember him, I had finished helping one of my uh, faculty doing carotid endarterectomy, and he told me, you know, one day we're gonna put uh, something that's gonna crush the plaque against the wall. I said, well, you, it's gonna throw all these, oh no, you wait and see, I, I swear. And, it's, it's, uh, and then five years, you know, five, several years later, stenting and so forth, uh, and, and then you know what happened over. So that clearly uh, the highest sl uh, slope that ha I have seen. How can we ignore what uh, you know endoscopic advances have done to the field? So I guess the two endos have uh, certainly, I've, in what I do, have, I've witnessed the largest <laughs> rise. Technology and science really driving a lot of it. Dr. Hanno, uh, back to you, with which disciplines do you think skull-based surgeons should uh, seek a greater collaboration? You sort of touched on this some, but I'd really like to hear from the panel about really who we need to in focus on engaging. I don't think there is a limit to um, the edges of that question, really. I mean, I, I think we've touched base, as you said, on this before, and I would think that the greatest propeller of this field is team science and team uh, patient care. I mean, the society was born out of that, where the limits of one specialty were, the, were, were just, the end of one specialty was just the beginning of, of, of the next specialty. And um, since we've already talked about adjuvant therapies and molecular approaches and, and um, targeted therapy and neoadjuvant treatments and these are these would be the fields that need to come into the scene here I mean we've got a lot of unanswered questions with 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 a lot of the diseases that we treat at, at the biological level as well as the adjuvant therapy level so that's who I think we should um, immediately uh, invite um, into into that space Next to that would be things like uh, back to the informatics infrastructure, computer science and databases and, and uh, um, artificial intelligence, if you will, using data that exists right now to inform some of what we do. Uh, so that's kind of what I think the future of this will be. Dr. Heilman, if you could choose one subspecialty to, that we should increase collaboration, what would that be? I'm I'd say medical oncologists. I mean, people have mentioned it before, but to me, the next five or ten years are individualized patient care, genetics. What's dry? What's what are the drivers of these tumors? And uh, you know, I've just I've, just like we mentioned with the BRAF inhibitors and papillary cranial pharyngiomas, that's a benign tumor that shrinks with a medicine. I've seen it in my own clinic. I had a patient with a pituitary tumor growing, growing, growing over six years. 
got put on eye brands for breast cancer, and over two years or two years, I know it got smaller and smaller and smaller over two years. So uh, if we start seeing these types of things happening over and over again, it's going to change the whole field. But we need them at this meeting to learn from. Yeah. Dr. Whitterk, and, and is there a surgical subspecialty that you think uh, could have more collaboration with skull base? Oh, surgical. Uh, hmm. No. <laughs> I think we already have you know, yeah. great collaboration um, uh, amongst. I can't uh, particularly think of one. You, you agree sort of medical oncology is the... Yeah, the I think I said that you know, you know, before. Yeah. And I guess the other thing is to collaborate with basic scientists as well so that we send uh, fresh tissue so that they can analyze it and help us come up with that. And that, uh, just as Ehab said, you need the bioinformatics for that. And then, um, up to this date, we haven't replicated the, uh, the work that uh, Jayden Shaw and colleagues have done to have an international collaboration uh, with that, and that, that we sh need to continue to do. Dr. DeMonte. Um, just, just to focus outside of medical profession, I mean, if we look at our quality of life um, studies that have been out there, 30% of our patients re consistently report a poor quality of life. And um, and we to, you think about in your own institution who addresses that? Is it's our our nurses, our psychologists, our physical therapists, our occupational therapists, our speech pathologists? I mean, I, I think if we're talking about in the Disney model of the whole, the whole experience and the, and satisfaction, that thirty percent is a, a big opportunity for us to to help our patients and and help their outcomes and and their satisfaction. So I. I I think, you know, having our um, speech pathologists here um, and talking about our swallowing outcomes and improving swallowing function or, or uh, our, our nursing uh, faculty, I think that's going to help us as well. That's yeah, higher than any other complication. Dr. Snyderman, which subspecialty do you think for collaboration? Yeah, outside of clinical areas, uh, which you know, I think we already have many great collaborations, I would say education. Um, we really don't uh, understand cognitive science of learning uh, we don't work with PhDs in, in education, and I, increasingly as we adopt minimally invasive techniques or, you know, use robotics and virtual reality, we're going to need their help in designing better, more effective curricula. Um, there's, there's a need to train surgeons outside of the OR. We can't continue with the model we have, and so we need to understand that space and, and be at the leading edge of, of uh, educational innovation. Um, yeah, but if I may add a warning here, but remember, it's a PhD in education who are forcing all these rules on us, <laughs> wellness and enough sleep and, you know, teaching the resistance. So, you know, sometimes if you let them go to their own devices, they can, they'll be adding layers and layers of complexity to what we do, but just, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm relatively convinced that Jacques doesn't sleep, so I don't think that's... You know, along the lines of what Carl said, uh, I think, too... A lot of times we ask our patients to make very difficult decisions. Do you want to have radio surgery or microsurgery, or do you want to have upfront neoadjuvant therapy and then have surgery? And of course, we give them our recommendations. But I think if we could understand better how to help people make decisions, how the science of decision making figures in to ultimate patient satisfaction, I, I think that would go a long way to improving people's quality of life. That's a tough one, important. Jacques, uh, here we see some moves. Um, what are the barriers, uh, do you think, to multidisciplinary? You know, we talk about these collaborations, how it needs to happen. Why doesn't it not happen more easily or more frequently? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a very good topic, very good question. Uh, I mean, luckily, first of all, it is happening, obviously, evidenced by what's happening here in, in this meeting on a yearly basis. Uh, but I would say uh, ego is probably the first barrier to multidisciplinary practice uh, without naming names around the world. There are people who are uh, solo skull-based surgeons, uh, sometimes doing a very good job because they just do the same thing uh, over and over again. It's perhaps surgically it's faster for them, less complexity, less uh, argument with uh, perhaps uh, other colleagues. So I would say that probably the, uh, the reason um, if the few out there that are doing skull-based surgery by themselves, that's the main reason they probably do it. Uh, then less important things, I'm sure, finances and other things get into it. But I'd say that would be the main, the main issue. 
Yes, Dr. Krauss. So I, I think it goes back to what uh, the two previous speakers talked about this morning, which is culture. And, you know, I, I, I just was fascinated listening to them, and they were both outstanding. You, you look at their results, and they speak for themselves. And yet, how many of us have heard our own CEOs at national and international meetings give that same presentation, preach the same thing, and then yet we come home and we're, we're, we're on the, the hook for another 5 to 7 percent productivity, that we're going to take away some of your support staff, that you're now going to be exper uh, responsible for tasks X, Y, and Z. So, you know, there was an element of listening to that talk that it was truly bringing Coles to Newcastle, and yet where, where does the rubber really meet the road? Because all of us are, are, are just overextended. And so I, I think when you look at that, that's probably the two things. It's the culture and it's, it's, it's being overextended in terms of being able to make that extra step and being able to, to, to have that collaboration. So yeah. that's my two cents. Dr. Snyderman, barriers, you think? For um, I mean, yeah, sort of a mindset. Um, uh, I mean, there are financial barriers, of course. Um, and, and that's a major obstacle in many institutions, um, especially when we travel around the world and we see how other uh, areas of the world work. You know, people work in different buildings. You know, there's, there's really no opportunity to work together. But I, I think also uh, we need to stop thinking of our specialties as, as having static walls. And, and it's really a, a bit of an obsolete uh, structure to think of, of departmental disciplines. We should be thinking more along service lines. You know, what do patients uh, seek? You know, how do how do diseases cluster together and build our care around that? So, skull base could become its own discipline, um, as opposed to being two disciplines working together. And you know, spine surgery is a perfect example. Why do we have two different disciplines doing spine surgery and they don't really work together? That should be one service line. And so, you know, I think we've created these artificial borders, and in the, in the distant future, you know, I think we're going to move away from that, and uh, this will continue to evolve, uh, you know, dynamically, perhaps become its own, its own training program, its own uh, uh, practice. Dr. Whitaker, a little different uh, healthcare, uh, perhaps more advanced healthcare uh, program in Canada. What are the barriers there to multidisciplinary practice in that uh -huh. setting? Yeah, uh, one of them is just physical location because uh, our neurosurgeons are separate from the uh, head and neck people uh, in hospital location. Uh, but uh, the biggest barrier to me is just actually being able to get together in a multidisciplinary fashion because I do a head and neck clinic every week with a radiation oncologist and we sit down, we examine the patients together and then we go out and we discuss what we think the best treatment plan is. Uh, for that individual patient. And so we're both seeing the same thing. And if they see something different, I can go and look at it. And I say, well, I don't think that. And we go look at this imaging together. We don't do that uh, well for skull base. We don't sit with the neurosurgeons, the radiation oncologists, the medical oncologists. We do tumor boards and whatnot, but um, it's, it's disparate. It, it, but when you physically have the patient in front of you examining together, it brings a wealth of information and interdisciplinary care that uh, I think is second to none. So if I could wait, we, and we started a skull-based clinic, but um, that's neurosurgery and Odo together, and we don't have the rad onc there, and uh, so it falls down. We, we have endo there, but uh, it still falls down. Dr. Hannah, do you have a comment? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to maybe talk about the facilitation rather than the barriers. I mean, there are so many barriers. Yeah physical barriers, co-location barriers, financial barriers, time-constrained barriers, maybe ego barriers. But really what it takes is leadership. I mean, that's the answer to overcoming these barriers. I mean, think about how the society was started. I mean, there were, you know, it was a few people, they had a vision, and they displayed leadership. And they said, this is what we're going to do. And I think in our institutions, um, and there are many examples of these types of teams in this room, institutions that function really well in a seamless multidisciplinary uh, fashion have had uh, leadership that set the tone, set the goal, set the vision, and, and, and sort of the value of uh, 
the mutual respect and collaboration with people from a different discipline and saying, this is the only way we're going to do this because it's the right way. And I, I think we can look at all these obstacles and barriers and say, you know, it's difficult to do this and that. But I think with dedicated leadership, um, the, the answer to these barriers are not that far away. Absolutely. One, one final question um, for all of us who really are, are trying to continue our careers and the people starting their careers in the audience. Really, what is the most meaningful career decision you made? A lot of times these things are not obvious up front. And uh, I think for most of us, there's a lot to learn from hearing this, uh, this, the answer to this question from you. So anyone, Jacques, go ahead, please. Uh, insisting on coming to this country. <laughs> this is my most meaningful decision. It, talking about barriers, um, I tried years just insisting and following what my dream, my passion, and obviously that was the most important decision I made. Dr. Link? Boy, that's really the hardest one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Um, you know, I, I have to admit, um, maybe another way to ask that is, you know, how did you end up where you are? And I have to say it's been just 100% luck. I, I don't know that uh, I don't know that I've uh, ever. I, I, I agree. I, I, I don't know that I've ever directed the ship. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I think certainly, you know, I was in practice uh, after fellowship for two years at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, which was a much smaller version of of where I am now. And when the opportunity came to go back to Rochester, Minnesota, which is the most awful place on the planet to live. Um, <laughs> Uh, I said, uh, you know, and I, I had a lot of self-doubt, you know, in my thinking at that time, I thought, you know, that, you know, this is the major leagues and I'm really doing good in Jacksonville. I really like it. It's a small team and, and I really feel like I can, I can be a leader down here. And I think to go back to Rochester and kind of take that, that leap, I guess, was the, was, was the thing that, that changed my life the most. Dr. Hanna? You know, it's interesting we talk about this today. Yesterday I met, and I'm not going to mention the name for, for sake of privacy, but the society here has a new program of mentorship where you pair a mentee with a mentor. Um, so I met my mentee yesterday, um, and he was sort of asking about, he's he just finishing his fellowship this year, and he's asking, what do I need to do to sort of, he didn't say that, but like, basically saying well, to be where you are. Um, and I, I said, you know, um, I had the honor of being the president of this society. I'm the current president of the American Head and Neck Society. I, I take care of a major head and neck journal. And none of these things I really worked towards getting. I never really positioned myself for any of these jobs um, by strategy or decisions to sort of navigate my career. I would say the most meaningful career decision I've made is that whatever was given to me, no matter how little, how at the time seemed insignificant, whether it is what I was planning to do or not, um, I've always just, just tried to do the very best I can in it, regardless of whether it's going to be enhancing to my career, uh, increasing my CV, or being you know, pleasing to this person or pleasing to that person. It was just a matter of really pursuing excellence. Um, and I think the most meaningful decision I made is to emulate people who demonstrated to, to me that being excellent in whatever task is giving to you is, is, is what you really um, do. And then the rest, uh, as Michael said, is pure <laughs> luck. I mean, you just, uh, you, you know, when I think about the twist and turn of my career, I applied for three fellowships that I really wanted. I didn't get any of them. I ended up in Pittsburgh, <laughs> <laughs> which was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. My top three choices, I did not match. And then after I finished my fellowship, I wanted to stay um, in, in several academic institutions. I ended up in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, I think Sam is in the room um, and worked with Sam Mefti for 10 years. Little Rock was not on my top five choices, 
Um, and uh, obviously from there I went to MD Anderson, which was tr truly um, just a, an, an amazing blessing to, to join that team. But none of those things was a career decision. The decision was wherever you are, just do the best job you can. That's great. Carl, other than deciding to work with me, what's the most meaningful uh, I career can, decision? I can tell you my biggest mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you, don't, like, you don't have to name us, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to reiterate what he have said. It's really about being receptive to opportunities. I never had a plan. I was, you could say I was in the wrong place at the right time, but really I ended up being in the right place at the right time. I wasn't looking to do skull-based surgery. It found me. And I think there are two types of people in this world. There's, there are those who know from day one what they want to do. They have their sight on that goal, and they have a laser-type focus that keeps them on that track. And that's fine. That works for certain personalities. Whereas others, I think, have a more meandering course, sort of seeing where life takes them, but you've got to be receptive to what comes your way and step into those roles and, and perform to your best. Um, and I think it's, this is not a one-time decision. This is, you know, a dozen times during the course of your career. You know, you go off and try new things. I tell um, my mentees that every 10 years you should shake up your life in a major way, and that may mean you know, not not a, not another spouse, but or but uh, <laughs> try to shake up in a more productive way, and uh, and 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 look for a new clinical area, a new collaboration, a new area of research. Go back to school. I went back to a school in 2011 and got an MBA um, because I was getting bored with skull-based surgery, and and so you you got to constantly be looking for new challenges, uh, th things that will open up uh, new doors for you. And then I'd just like to add a second uh, good career decision that I made, and that was working with uh, uh, other disciplines. Um, I like to, you know, I, you learn so much from getting outside your own specialty. I like to read a diverse literature outside of medicine. I don't like hanging out with doctors all that much. You know, you learn so much more from, from, from other disciplines. Dr. DeMonte, most meaningful decision? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Two, two parts. Well, I, I guess the, the thing that affected my career the most was actually going to MD Anderson. But that required the decision to significantly truncate what I did as a neurosurgeon. You know, I trained in a top-notch vascular center. Uh, we were doing epilepsy, spine. In order to follow that path, I, I had to philosophically say, okay, I'm going to follow this path, and I'm going to not do any more spinal surgery, not going to do vascular surgery, not going to do epilepsy surgery. And uh, that's a hard decision. That's kind of scary um, early on in your career to kind of put all eggs in one basket. But I think that decision made a big impact on my career. That's great. Yeah. Dr. Krauss? So I, I think about all the answers that everyone has given, and, and the one that strikes me is marrying my wife. So, you know, I've, I've been married to the same person for more than 30 years. Um, she, she's always let me be me. Um, I, I know that I am far from being a, a perfect spouse. Uh, certainly she has uh, probably put more than 50% into our three very successful adult children. And so I think for me, not having to go through the, the disruptive uh, effects of a, of a, a big shakeup in a, at, at home has really allowed me to, to concentrate my energies on better endeavors. So. Sorry she's not here today to hear this from, from, from me, but uh, I think that's really the thing that, that probably professionally uh, impacted me the greatest. I mean, all the other choices, all the other luck, all the other things that people have alluded to are, are, are all correct, and, and you know, it's just good fortune. And, and, and you know, it's like the golfer Chichi Rodriguez used to say, the, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Um, so I, I think we have all have work habits that, that set us up for success. But for me, the end of the day, you know, being, being with my wife, Daryl, the last three decades has really been a game changer. That's wonderful. I'll call Daryl, let her know. Thank Dr. you, we have. Uh, Dr. Heilman. No, I would just say, I was just trying to decide between spending my life trying to be a vascular surgeon, doing aneurysms, or do tumors. And just, I'm just glad I didn't pick aneurysms because that field <laughs> is dwindling away and everyone that <laughs> did that in my generation had to go back and retrain. So really was just picking tumors over vascular and, uh, Work out fine. And Dr. Witterick? Yeah, uh, I finished residency in 1992, and then I did a head neck oncology fellowship, did open skull base, and then I wanted to do a second uh, fellowship in rhinology, and uh, then I was told 
at the time, well, why would you want to be a nose picker? Why would you want to suck snot out of the nose? All these kinds of things, but I just sort of followed. I thought this is an evolving field. And then um, the same people that were criticizing me later on said, isn't it great you do the two things as we sort of merged open and into endoscopic. And so then all of a sudden I was like the poster child um, uh, for the two disciplines. Um, and the, but the, the big thing that I, I wanted to say with that is just for people in the audience that you're going to have roadblocks and people just stand in your way. And one thing that I learned easily, or, or not easily, but learned early on is you just sort of, excuse me, excuse me, and you wave at them as you're going by them. Uh, and so sometimes the, the roadblocks, you, you can get around them. Don't No does not mean no. To me, it's a maybe. And so I think you keep on you pushing what you think and your own agenda. Fantastic. I want to thank all of the past presidents for all of this advice. And I think for all of us, it's been, speaking for myself, really, really very useful. And thank you very much. Thank you.